Welcome to the Start of Grind. Tell us a little bit about uh, where you grew up. Um, kind of tell us a little bit about your family. Tell us a little bit about yourself. You're here in Silicon Valley. Um, yeah, speak. I'm from Atlanta. I grew up in Atlanta. Um, I was a regular kid that wanted to do regular things at first, I guess. And then um, something was in the air that said you should become a producer. And um, I just started tracing what the producer was and following a lot of different other producers that were doing it um, at this particular time when I was like 11 and 12 years old. And um, um, from there, I just rolled into just, you know, the, the education of wanting to continue to be a music producer. And um, one thing led to the next, and the next led to me getting artists and uh, creating my own company. And um, 20 years later, I'm celebrating my 20th anniversary. Congratulations, man. That's huge. Um, tell us about, do you remember the first song you ever produced? What was it? Um, the first song that I ever produced that y'all heard was Crisscross Cross Jump, um, which was in 92. <laughs> um, so, uh, We've heard that one. Yeah, we heard that one. <laughs> which is funny because this month, that song is 21 years old. Can yeah. you believe it? Yeah. What, what, what about the first song we've never heard of? Do you remember? Do you remember the um, first yeah, song? Yeah, there's a couple of songs you never heard. I mean, well, you know, like I said, I started producing when I was 14. Um, and then I created Criss Cross when I was 19. Yeah. So um, I was actually the youngest producer to ever have a number one record. Hmm. Um, and, that, you know, there was a lot of records that came before that. Um, um, I have an interesting story because I had a lot of groups that I didn't have an opportunity to do things with because I didn't have the outlet. Yeah. Uh, I had Criss Cross on one side and I had TLC on the other. And TLC sure. was my group as well as Criss Cross. Hmm. Um, and the girls felt like I was more in tune with the guys than I were with them. So they told me they was going to have a meeting with another record company. And I could have got mad about it and said no and been greedy, but I used them as a, a launching pad for my production company to, to grow. Yeah. So when they went and got their deal, I worked on their album and continued to do what I, you know, to. You had, you had a great history and, and continue to with Mariah Carey. Tell us, how, how did you originally meet her? What, how, do you remember those first interactions with her? Yeah, I met Mariah through Criss Cross. We, we, I think it was like, uh, probably around the same time, the Grammys, because Criss Cross Jump was nominated for a Grammy in 92. Yeah. I think at a Grammy party we met and uh, you know, it was all on the same label, and she was basically the, the, the queen of Columbia, and we were like the new kids on the block, and Tommy Mottola basically was like, you know, you should go work with him, or Jermaine, you should work with her, and um, we didn't know exactly what it was going to be, but um, it turned out to be one of her biggest records um, that time, at that period when I worked on was Always Be My Baby, it was the first single that I did for her that became one of her, you know, number one records. Talk about 20, I mean, you're 20 years in, so talk about some of the ups and downs of being an entrepreneur. What, what do you think, you know, you're in a room full of people, many of them are probably just coming up, just, just starting, and, you know, what, what are some of the hardest parts of being an entrepreneur, in your opinion? Well, I mean, well, coming from where I'm from, I came from Atlanta, basically, where um, at, the, at 92, it wasn't cool to be from the South. Yeah. Um, it wasn't the thing to say, hey, I'm from Atlanta. And people would be like, yay, good. It's almost like people would shine it away. Like, yeah. And trying to get into the music business, which was New York and LA driven at that time, uh, from the hip hop community, which was more just New York driven, um, it was the, the hardest it could possibly ever be. And, you know, and I was young, I wasn't even of age, so um, getting an adult to believe that you know what you're talking about is the worst thing in the world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, and, and it's, it's interesting because as I, I started so young that that continued on through life. Yeah. You know what I mean? As, as I went from one company to the next company, you know, developing artists, people still had this thing in their mind that he's younger than our whole office and he's from the South, so what does he know more than you guys? You know yeah. what I mean? So it's always been that type of uphill battle for so me. So, I mean, how did you overcome that? Was that just by, by, by your results, by your work? It yeah, was, you got to make hits. That's it. Yeah. yeah. You delivered good. <laughs> yeah, you, built good you built good products and people listen. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. the same here. 
yeah. right? Yeah. Um, t talk about, you, you've talked about kind of surviving long enough to find your place, you know, to hit that groove. Yeah. T tell us a little bit about how, how, do, how should an entrepreneur, you know, how do they push through those points of where it's like, I should just give up? Because a lot of times, you know, you find entrepreneurs, they just, they give up too soon. Yeah. You know, they, they never hit the groove because they just, they run out of time, they run out of money, they run out of, you know, sleep or patience. Yes. H how do you do it? H how, do you, how do you push through in those moments? I mean, for, well, I guess for me, you have to find the value of whatever it is that you're trying to develop or create or whatever it is. And once you, and, and, and it's layers of the, the value, basically. It's a top layer that usually is the layer that they pay attention to that you're talking about. And that layer doesn't really give you the real true definition of your value, basically, right? And then you, you have to find the real value and what the value is to another person. And once you see what the value is to another person, that's what gives you that second win. Because from there, you know that it's no way that you could possibly give up. There's no way if I stop now, I see that I'm stopping something that somebody else wants to be a part of. Yeah. At, at what point did you know uh, you know, at what points did you say, wow, I've, I've hit something? Did you have, you know, people say they have a break or, you know, some people here today have said we got lucky at this point. Was there a point where you said, hey, all my work has paid off? At what point did you hit your groove? When, when was it? Was it with Criss Cross? Was it, was it down the road further? When was it for you? Um, I mean, I think, I think the first groove was Criss Cross, basically, because, I, you know, it was like I thought about my career a lot from 12 to 19, right? Mm. And I had this built-in mentality in my head that all my friends worked at McDonald's and other places like this, right? It was 16 years old, they got these jobs and they had to work at McDonald's. And I was lucky enough to be a dancer and a break dancer and all of this, where I was getting a little bit of money that, that was good enough for a 16-year-old, right? Yeah. So I, was, I didn't have to get that McDonald's job, but then I knew that after 19, I was going to have to get a real job, but this is going to get serious and, you know, life gets really serious. So I really put in my head that I have to work extremely hard and as hard as I could possibly work to not have to get that job. And that's all I cared about. So the groove was for me to avoid going to work at McDonald's or yeah. wherever, wherever we was going to go have to work at. So I didn't want that job, period. Yeah. So I just would start to focus on... Um, as many things as I thought could get me to avoid working there. <laughs> so, you know, if that's the case at that point in time, you don't have to dream about the biggest things in the world. You could just dream about if I make $10,000, right. my mother's not going to make me work at McDonald's. Right. Right? Yeah, I don't, I don't need to make a million. Yeah, I, I just have, need I to don't make 10,000. I don't have to make a lot of money. I could just make enough money so I <laughs> get don't have to back. get out of here. Yeah, I don't have to. I, look, Ma, I got $10,000. I can stay in the house and I have to go nowhere. So when you have that type of goal in your head, it's not really like you're not, you're not trying to grab onto the biggest thing in the world. So when right. the biggest thing in the world happens, you got to think, I'm thinking like I'm going to make 15 grand at the most, right? Right. Criss Cross sold 8 million records. Wow. And they weren't a dollar each, right? <laughs> you know, so it's like, it wasn't my dollar. It was somebody else's dollar they wanted. Right. But, you know, when you, so you're thinking, you're not thinking small, but you're just thinking about a goal and a place that you wanted to go and reach. And then you outdo what you was thinking about. That lets you know you kind of have hit that, that, you know, you hit a pace. But I mean, I met another guy right after I did the crisscross record and we had sold 8 million records and I thought we was the biggest thing in the world and um, Babyface I don't know if y'all are familiar with Babyface but Babyface that's, that's what we call Kyle in the back who's producing <laughs> but uh, yeah it's a different guy Babyface saw me for anybody that don't know Babyface wrote End of the Road for Boys the Men he's like one of the biggest songwriters in the world ever in the history of music so he, he said um he said, Jermaine, nice to meet you. You have that little record out. And I hmm. said, <laughs> little record? Like, who's, oh, cool. We're going to be good. I'm thinking, like, who is this guy talking to? He must know. <laughs> and I'm younger, by the way. So I'm way more cockier than I yeah. am supposed to be. Right? And uh, he's like, yeah, you know, um, I, heard this, I heard this song, and um, the guys are doing great, and it's incredible that y'all are from Atlanta, and y'all can do this. And I'm like, 
why is he talking to me like we haven't really done anything? You yeah. know? And I'm like, this record's number one. Bruce Springsteen is like number two. <laughs> Do you like understand what's going on right now? And I'm, and I'm, this is what's going on in my head, and he's talking to me. And then he says, well, you know, as a producer and a songwriter, um, you're not successful until you do that multiple times. Mm. And that that's the first, that one piece of information was the brick that hit me in my head that stopped everything that was going on in my world about crisscross. Yeah. And that one particular, in like that one minute, all the success that I had with crisscross was gone. And everything else was grind from that place you gotta on. start out keep yes. going do it again yeah we call here we call once you're lucky twice you're good right yeah and uh i think it's interesting like i mean you have a good it's a great insight of hey i just got to make ten thousand dollars because a lot of times even on the stage right we had we had a billionaires up on the stage today and it's like you know or vc saying you got to build a hundred million dollar business like let's start with a million dollar business right and then or like a hundred or like a ten thousand dollar business and then we'll like we'll work our way up right yeah. and and we can get there um, talk about, tell us about, you're the founder of Global 14, um, tell us about what it is and tell us about, uh, you have some very interesting insights on community, uh, which we kind of feel like we are as well. So uh, tell us about Global 14, what it is, and, and tell us about uh, what community means to you. Well, Global 14 is a, is a place that I started because I was a little frustrated with other social sites, right? Yeah. Um, I became the president of Virgin Records at... 2004 or something, I don't know what year it was, somewhere around in there. Um, and um, Janet Jackson was the biggest artist on the label and was trying to run, launch her new project and things to do. And I, I, um, I wasn't really even, uh, I won't say tech savvy, I wasn't really into social like that, right? I was very much into computers and, and programming because I make music, but I wasn't really on the sites because I felt like it was like a waste of time. Yeah. Um, but I had all these interns at my studio that was like, I'll come out of the studio and they had their computers and they was on their computers all the time. And I'm like, what is this guy doing? And he's not working. So then I ask him, I say, <laughs> I say, yo, what are you doing? And he's like, I'm on MySpace. And I'm like, what the hell is MySpace? And they explained to me what it was and I looked at it and, I'm, and when I looked at it, for me looking at it I, it looked like just a whole bunch of junk. And I'm like... Yeah, that's kind of what it looked like to us, too. <laughs> you know? I'm like, I'm, like, I'm like, what is... Why, I'm like, why are you spending all your time on here talking to girls and you don't even know these people? Like, what the hell is going on? And it wasn't even about music. They was just actually trying to meet girls and girls was talking back to them, posting pictures of them yeah, in bathing girls. suits. and Girls, right? Girls, just yeah. to sit. Right. That we thought, you know, it probably was the little fish thing back then, right? Right. Catfish back then. Uh, but anyway, um, so they they explained to me what MySpace was. So as a person that was already very much into computers and Pro Tools and things like that, I was from I come from a different side of the computer world where I have to I'm inside a computer creating music and moving sure. things and doing other things. So when I got on there, I'm thinking that MySpace is a hundred times more than what I actually, than what it was. I went in there with a mindset that, okay, if I, MySpace, this must be the place where I can do this and this must be the place where I can do this and this must be the place I can do this. So when I got in MySpace, I started seeing that, you know, immediately, as soon as I signed up, I had like 70,000 friends or something crazy. Right. right? So I'm like, wow, all these people here for me, I can talk to them. So then I'm like, I wonder if I can send all of these guys one message. And they had some bull bulletin that you could post that didn't do exactly what I wanted it to do. Right. But it was some bulletin. But they had to go to the bulletin in order to see the bulletin. Right. Like, you know, it's like me writing something outside that room and expecting all of these people to go see it. That's and so basically not you, 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 you wanted MySpace <laughs> to do all these different things. As a social network, as a product, you, you couldn't, it couldn't yeah, it so I, deliver. Yeah, it was, yeah, I started finding out the things that I thought it was there for, right. it didn't do, right? So then I started noticing that, but then I started noticing the good of it. I started noticing the good of that. I talked about the Janet Jackson record coming out and her fans started coming to my MySpace page and they started posting artwork that they had created thinking that I would show it to her, right? 
And this is the part where I was telling you about the value. The value of what I, what I started doing on MySpace, I started noticing my value between the artist and the consumer. And what I meant to as that middle piece of the yeah. puzzle, right? So the consumer felt like if they sent something to me, it was damn sure possible that he was going to show it to that artist, right? Right. So I became like that person on MySpace as a connecting piece because Janet wasn't on MySpace. Of course. And nobody, the virgin people, that these guys, they definitely wasn't on right. MySpace, right? So It was a uh, way to access you, somebody they could never, ever access any other way. Yeah. Right? So it was yeah. like, yeah, so the access became like, a person that's probably been trying to get that attention forever. Sure. Now, these, these people that was trying to get the attention were kids that was incredible with artwork. They wasn't just making like art that looked like, you know, home. It was really, really some of the best art I had ever Quality. seen, right? It was so good that I was like, you know what? I'm a president, so I could go to the office and say this. I said, listen, you know what? It's kids on MySpace that's way better than y'all. <laughs> and they was like, what the, they they want me to be fired? I know immediately. Like, let's get him out of here. So I, I I kept seeing this one day, and I was like, you know what? I said we should do a contest where your fans that send in a album cover, you pick four covers, and we make that become the cover. And these kids get their artwork in the store, as well as they feel like they are being. Um, they're being recognized by the person that they idolize. Yeah. So it's a true engagement right here, right? And that was the beginning of what, I, what, what Global 14 is because that was a connection piece to the fan, the artist, and me, the person that created this, this event, right? And, you know, Janet Jackson's known all over the world, everywhere. Sure. So the contest inside the office, when I told them, all the people was all the executives and workers, they was exactly you know extremely ecstatic about it. And then these guys from legal came in the room. Yeah. <laughs> like this girl coming in here like now. Right? <laughs> they come in and they say, you know what? Um, this contest, we can't do this contest global. We're exposed. Yeah. We can yeah. only do this in the United States. Sure. And I'm like, what? What type of... I'm like, how do you even work here and this is what you're talking about? Like, this is really, like, I'm really discouraged at this point. So all I started thinking about was global. What year is this? This is 2003? Yeah, I don't, I don't know exactly. It's somewhere around 2004, five, yeah. 2005. And, and I'm just thinking, like, so... And by the way, I'm on MySpace. I'm a user of MySpace at this point to the point where I'm on there every day looking and seeing where these kids are sending these pictures from. So it's a majority of pictures is coming from Europe. A lot of kids from London are sure. doing a lot of this artwork. So I'm like, oh man, you know, they gonna really hate me. This is what I tell the room. I'm like, these kids online are gonna fuck me up if I go back and tell them <laughs> that I can't, I can't, I can only give this to you, but I can't give it to kids them. Kids can do dangerous things. They, yeah, exactly. Find right? you. So, so these guys that's in there that's from corporate and legal, they don't even understand what I'm saying. They think that I'm in some, some Jermaine Dupree world believing that these people even matter, right? So they're like, Jermaine, all you gotta do is just, we're gonna put it up there. You don't even have to say nothing. I'm like, you don't understand. I am actually on the site. They know that it's me. They yeah, see you can't the activity. Turn your back on them I now. can't just turn it off and put up a, a, a letter from you. Right. I said that's really gonna. That's and that's and that's a document. Change that's your what thumbnail they, to a legal document. Yeah, that's what they wanted me to do, basically. And that was that was so frustrating. I love when my friends do that. Yeah. It just it just disappears. It's like oh, it's a legal document. Yeah. Now. So it was so cool. frustrating to me, as and as a user of MySpace. So then, when that happened. That really pissed me off. So I was really mad from that point. So I went away from MySpace at that point with this angry, angry mind. And then Twitter came. Yeah. And Aston Kutcher was in Atlanta doing something, and he challenged CNN. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And it was to on get a million radio. users, yeah, him versus Larry yeah, King. Yeah, it was on the radio, right? First, and this right. all happened right in my right. city. So I'm thinking, okay, That's Twitter right. must be the answer for my MySpace problems. Well, I don't <laughs> get it. <laughs> you know? And so I jump on Twitter. And once again, I'm frustrated. Well, you got 600,000 followers. You shouldn't be <laughs> yeah, too, too well, but Yeah, but, but you can't engage them to do nothing. Right. Well, let's, let's so, and I, 
I we'll want to give the audience a chance to ask some questions, but All right. uh, t tell me this. Uh, you know, someone that is so good at producing music and uh, at creating music, why, why then take, why then move into something else? Or, or, or it seems different. It's, it's not in some ways. It's very similar. But why, why, why kind of shift into technology? Tell us, tell us, tell us why you're doing that other well, than to solve that, these problems. That one little situation between me, the fans, and Janet, the artist, was the, the reason. Yeah. It, it, it made me realize... It frustrated you so much. But it, No, no, no. I, we had a marriage as yeah. far as the, me, the people on MySpace, sure. and the artists. Um, the frustration came from those that didn't understand that world. Okay. Right? And what I saw right there was my value and what I brought to the table as far as the introduction of what's going on in tech and the introduction of what's going on in music. And then... Like when I created Global 14, I, I, people was telling me, I said, I said, I'm going to create my own social network. I, these places don't do what I wanted to do. I'm going to do exactly what I want to do, and I can make this world whatever I want it and, and, and you know, design it how I want to do it. People was like, no, you can't. No, it's not going to happen. The whole tr transformation of making Global 14 felt just like when I was a child trying to become a producer. People was telling me, no, you're from Atlanta. It was almost like the exact same thing. So it was like, it wasn't frustrating to get to that point. Yeah. All I was determined to at that point was to get back to those 70,000 people that was on MySpace. It was, the number wasn't even that big, but it was just like, you know, for the first time I had my hands on the person that this on company, the yeah, yeah. The, the, this, this company over here has been telling me that they was taking my material to the study group, right? And I'm like, this study group always talk about this study group. You've never seen these people before. It's like, who the hell is this study group? They told me we played the music for the study group. It came back with this and it came back. I'm like, show me the study group. Let me talk to them. Because if they come back and they say they don't like something, I'm like, who are these people? <laughs> It's almost like a Nelson. It's those the same Nil people the doing Nilsen. the catfishing. I'll tell you, that's who it yeah, is. It's doing like that. Group. But it's, I yeah. feel like it's the same people that's with the, the, the Nielsen sound scan, the thing that's in your TVs, right? right? I don't know one person that's got one of those boxes. Hmm. I know a lot of people. Anybody here got a box? <laughs> Anybody here got one of those? Nobody has that box. See what I'm saying? So it was the same thing. They kept telling me about this study group. I'm like, you know what? For the first time, I got my hands on this study group that they're talking about. Yeah. And I'm getting ready to take this study group, and I'm going to control the study group, and then they're going to have to ask me about it. And that's what it was. From that point, that was, that was my charge at that point. Was to, the number of how many people I had didn't matter. Mm -hmm. It was just the fact that once I get the control of being able to tell you that you're not going to sell, you have lost the power with me, right? And that's what it was. It was just basically me getting my hands wrapped around that. So jumping into it, I knew, you know, it's a real world. Everybody in here has real jobs, and everybody is really passionate about what they do. And I don't want none of y'all to think that I'm coming from the music world, and I think I'm just going to bust into this world, and it's going to work for me, and y'all just going to be left out looking crazy. I, I decided that, you know, I had to really jump into this world and let people understand that I'm passionate about what's going on inside of the tech world. Yeah. And what's going on inside of the tech world has, has been ignored by my generation and my industry. And it's still being ignored by my industry, but we all are using each other. Right. You know what I'm saying? It's no way sure. that tech doesn't survive without music. And it's no way music doesn't survive without tech. And me just being a person that's paying attention before a lot of people, it was just the way that my car turned and drove me. That's a good insight. Um, if, if we're going to take two questions. Let's take them over. Just come over by Andy. Let me ask you one more thing. How do you balance, you know, so, you know, there's this idea of testing an idea, validating it with the customers, with the, with the fans, with the users, or there's this idea of like, hey, I just know this is, this is cool. I just know this is going to be, people are going to love this. H how do you balance those two things of like, you know, is it just in your gut? Do you just have this great natural product sense of, 
this is going to be a hit record, this is going to be a great product, I don't need to ask people, or um, do, you think, do you think there is, I mean, how do you balance those two things? Do you just say, you know? I mean, well, a lot, with me, what I've learned is you have to be a fan of whatever product that it is that you do. You know, I was talking to the guy from SoundCloud, the CEO to, earlier, yeah, Alex. and we was talking about how majority of people, like in tech world, they create things, but they're not the actual users of the product that they actually create. Like, you go on the site, you don't actually see this person on the site the way they're supposed to be, right? Or sure. musically, right? Same way. When I create a song, I do the exact same thing y'all would do with the record. I go get it, go get it in my car drive to the store, drive back to this place that I was, drive back to the store. <laughs> and if it doesn't sound right in the second time that I drive to the store, then I don't put it out. You know what I mean? It's like a real, you have to do, you know, you have to go through the same channels of, that, the, that the fan would actually go through. Or you have to, have to be from the same place that that fan is. And yeah. I just think that I'm one of these guys that's actually from the same place that the majority of everybody is from. I think somebody, somebody that sounds like what you're talking. Somebody said it here yesterday, this morning. But you know, basically, the, some of the best products are are the ones where the founder kind of is the product. You know, and, and you clearly are with with all the amazing things you've done. Uh, let's let's give uh, let's give Jermaine a huge round of applause. Um, we got one question. We'll let we'll let you stand up for him in one minute. Oh, that's pretty good. We're going to do one question real quick, Arj. Go ahead, Arj. Hey, Jermaine. Arj from doing? Australia. Quick question. Uh, how closely are you involved with the product um, in the development side of things? I don't know. Have you taken up coding? Do you get advice from Zuckerberg? <laughs> what is it? Do you get advice from Zuckerberg? How, do you, how close are you with the product, uh, the product development? Um, well, yeah. No, I don't, I don't even have a Facebook page, by the way. Um, me, personally. Um, I'm, I'm so close to it that I don't believe that I should have that and I try not to um, get any kind of influence from other places. Um, I don't. I don't. I don't know if me and Mark would even get along. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> because I. I. You know. I. I. I'm, I'm. A lot of times people view me as a competitor, and they don't want to share information with me. Right? And that's cool. But whatever. Uh, but I, I don't know. I mean, I just don't. I think we come from completely two different worlds. But I, I understand what he's doing, and and on my site, yes, I'm the number one person on the site as far as I use it way more than other people. I use my site so much that I found out that it doesn't do things that I wanted it to do. You know what I mean? The same way I did with MySpace, and I'm getting frustrated, and I go in there and we switch it and we turn it up, and you know what I mean? So I, I, I believe that's the only way you can make it be exactly what I wanted to be because that's where it came from. The idea came from the frustration. So when I get on it, it has to work. You know, it has to do things that I believe that, that it's not even doing. Thank you. Well, let's, um, you know, I said this at the beginning, but, you know, uh, uh, JD came all the way out here from Atlanta literally to do this. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we're super grateful for it. Thank and you. Uh, our community is grateful. So let's, let's give JD a big round of Thank applause. Thank you for having me.